thanks for uh, inviting me yet again to Ballarat. Uh, we are using modern technology, but I am sure that the day will come that I might actually end up and uh, um, present to you in person. But it won't be today. And um, I have prepared, I think, something special for you today. Um, we don't want to do, be doing the, right, the, the same thing time and yet again. But um, before before we get there, uh, you can you can tell from my from my long title, I put some work in that uh, this time. But uh, you're all aware of this. Um, um, I, I I'm very keen to to uh, share my my insights, my analysis, my research, my observations, uh, and maybe eventually a forecast here and there. Um, but there's absolutely no financial advice that I'm that I'm giving tonight. Um, if something could be construed as financial advice, that just means that you have misunderstood me. And I'm, I'm pretty certain that we're all um, old and wise enough to, uh, to understand this. Now, step back. Um, I want to place an ode to the jester. Uh, we all know the jester that in the medieval times uh, used to be, uh, every king had at least, at least one, uh, the royalties, Definitely liked them. Uh, we know them from. Uh, they were very popular because they uh, they did a lot of fart jokes. And if you go to stand up com comedians these days, you will find that uh, what what people find funny hasn't really changed that much over the over the years. But lesser known is that the the really good jesters they were actually um, they were actually consultants in those days. Uh, they would they would give the, the king very good uh, advice sometimes preventing the king from doing something stupid but you couldn't of course tell the king that he was be he was being stupid because you, you might risk your head so you had to be witty you had to be smart and you had to be intelligent about it and that's how the most intelligent ones uh, got their message across i am going to try to emulate uh, the, the jester today so I'm gonna make a joke here and there. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask questions. I'm gonna be hopefully I'm gonna be funny every once in a while. I'm gonna ask, um, but and luckily I'm at a distance, so you can't throw rotten tomatoes at me. Um, but just for those who need a little bit of a stimulus to the imagination, imagine me that I'm now wearing a funny hat on my head. My shoes are way too large for my feet. And I'm actually wearing a bath towel around my waist because as a shareholder in ResMed and in CSL, in the past few weeks, I've literally lost my shirt and my pants. And in that, uh, and in, from that persona, I will now present to you tonight's presentation. Hopefully you will like it as much as I will. When I, when I look at the share market, people find, always find something to complain about. I mean, it's the machines, it's the, the big end of town, it's uh, it's manipulated, uh, you, you, you name it. I always look at the share market from the perspective of humans. It's us, it's us that make up the market and, and we, are, we are flawed. And when I say these things, uh, it's because um, I've read Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman and when I say people are lazy, people are probably overestimating their own powers and capabilities. We're also very biased. Um, all these things have a fundamental in, in science. And if you ever want to figure out how flawed and how biased we are, both you and I and all our fellow human beings, then this book would be uh, a nice way to start. Um, I can highly recommend it, and it 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 teaches you a lot not a, not only about yourself but also about all these other humans that are participating in the share market. I'm on social media. Um, one of the things that's that that has definitely struck me over the over the the years is that um, they always say that women are from Venus and men are from Mars. But I think we can make a, a similar comparison between traders and investors. And I've, I've definitely come to the conclusion that um, both are so different 
they literally don't understand each other. And I always think in from that perspective that maybe the most important element to understand here is that traders and investors don't understand each other. They really talk a different language. They have a different uh, thing, different uh, view on things. And that's basically just how it is. That is also what, what makes the market. Now, I just already uh, I pointed out that the market is made up of people and, and we're not very good at what we do, basically. Um, you ask the average audience if they are better than average uh, in anything, right? but let's say that in, in this case, I would ask the audience, do you think that you're better than the average investor? And uh, on average, three quarters of the audience would go like, yep, I'm better, I'm better than average which of course statistically is impossible. Three quarters of us can't be better than average. Anyway, that's just one example. Um, another example is, is, is illustrated here in, the, in this survey done by, uh, by JP Morgan, but I could, I could drag in other surveys that have, have similar conclusions. Um, two things to watch here. So they've obviously surveyed uh, retail investors or investors in general in the United States. You see the difference here, the market did this and the annual return on average was a lot less by, by investors. Why is this? Well, we're not only just overestimating what, what we're good at. Um, we like to complain uh, to stockbrokers, to fund managers, uh, but not never about ourselves. Um, it's very difficult to make accurate predictions. Uh, 2023, and potentially 2022 as well have have basically shown that uh, predictions are are just that. Um, I mean, I could easily label 2023 as the the year that almost no prediction has been proven correct. Um, in general terms, we 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 we, tell, we tend to buy at the wrong time. We tend to sell at the wrong time. When there's a lot of volatility in markets, it's very difficult. To uh, to keep to keep your wits and to keep to keep uh, to stay where you are, but maybe equally also, I mean, uh, one of the one of the things that has that I've really learned over the past few years is uh, just remember not that long ago how how popular Bitcoin was and all those cryptocurrencies, and I always thought the only reason why that is is because the price goes up, and and now that whole sector has 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 stopped. Uh, going up in in price and and on my observation the the average interest has just plummeted. Um, it didn't matter at the time whether whether it was regulated or not regulated, whether you could get your money uh, back if you lost it. Uh, anything didn't matter. It was all about it, the price is going up. I want to be part of this, and that has also taught me a lot about how how people basically invest. It's only now, of course, that the Australian government has taken up the plan of of, um, of regulating at least the, the 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 exchanges in in Australia. But it's obviously way too late for those who already lost their money in the sector. Um, investing it's uh, it's not for everyone. I'm, I have to say, it's definitely not in in the same manner as I pointed out. I, I already touched upon it a little bit. Um, as editor of FN Arena, we, 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 we read a lot of, of expert views. We, we have the forecasts, we have the data, we bring them all together and make them available to investors. Often they are criticized and a lot. Um, and, and people sometimes ask me like, what are these forecasts actually worth? Well, if anyone's interested, uh, the number is six out of 10. So, I've, I've done some research uh, a while back and, and with the broker research, for example, depending on how you measure it, of course, but uh, there was some subjectivity there. But in general terms, you can make an argument that six out of 10 is, is accurate. So it's very much up to you whether you emphasize the four or you emphasize the six. And if you talk to, uh, to fund managers, for example, uh, six out of 10, uh, they're very happy with that if they can, if they can achieve that. In a year, when 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 you when they run into seven out of ten, um, they know what's coming next. It's a bit like for those who play golf, they will they will know what's coming. When you have a few rounds and you can just you can just hit and everything you do works, um, you know what's coming next. Next come the rounds when you can't hit a ball, 
And basically the same thing for fund managers. If they have a year out of seven out of 10, they know they should be worried. Uh, ultimately, it's the market that 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 does it. It's not us. Um, same thing with uh, with 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 investors. I'm assuming that uh, if we achieve you and I, if we achieve six out of ten in any given year, we have a reasonably good year. This reminds me about um, a, I had the pleasure for for a number of years uh, to read the daily newsletter of Dennis Gartman. Um, unfortunately, um, he is no longer publishing that. But at one stage, years ago, though, I must say, maybe that that in that that speech is still available on the internet. He gave a, a wonderful presentation, um, basically opening up about in his career that the numbers would deteriorate year after year. So he wouldn't even get to six out of ten. I mean, it would the number that he got of good trades against bad trades would, would deteriorate year in, year out. Yet his profits would, 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 would increase year in, year out. So what he was actually been able to do so in his career was basically to maximize the good trades and to minimize the bad trades. And maybe as an investor, that is more important than, than, when, than the number of trades that we, that we simply um, have correct. Coming back to... Um, to the human aspects of the share markets, um, I on, on a regular occasion I, I, I come to the conclusion that we we really don't understand what's happening in the share markets. Um, in recent times, uh, for example, shareholders at the AGM of, of CSL uh, more than twenty three percent or so voted against the numeration of the board for the simple reason that the share price hadn't hadn't moved or actually had gone downwards. Um, if there's anything I think that, that you can't blame the CSL board for, that's the share price. I mean, they have absolutely no control over it. Being a watcher from the sidelines, I think these guys are doing a commendable job in running the business. And unfortunately, uh, that doesn't always uh, correspond in the share price going up. Uh, that's just simply how the market works every once in a while. But us being us, we like to blame someone. And in this case... It had to be the board, of course. Um, coming back to, to what I sort of mentioned already, we've, we've had a lot of forecasts in 2022 and in 2023 that haven't genuinely worked out uh, in both senses. Um, if you're very critical about the share market, um, then the returns last year uh, on average uh, at the index level in particular uh, weren't fantastic, and that's probably brutally mildly. And this year we're sort of uh, looking towards a similar year on, on, unless we really get a, a very strong rally into year end. Um, the reason why the index sold off, and we are in October already, but this index is sold off, still sitting on a little bit of a profit this year, is because Australia happens to be a, a country where you can get a lot in dividends. Otherwise, um, we, we might have been in negative territory at this point. Um, it's going to be a little bit technical, but uh, I'm, I'm going to keep it. Uh, not, I'm going to keep it uh, uh, to the layman's level here. Um, a lot of forecasts were for a share market that ultimately was destined for much lower lows, and and those forecasts they seemed uh, valid in, in particular in 2022, and they haven't materialized, and this is the reason why. In, in, in the technical lingo, we're talking about equity risk premium. Now, sometimes we come across these words, never in, in, the, in the mainstream media, but the sector likes to talk about these, these very technical terms. Essentially, what this means is that usually there's a valuation difference between equities and bonds uh, in, in relationship because bonds are supposed to be uh, uh, lesser risk. And, and you can tell here from this chart here that the, the, the average of the ERP all of a sudden declined in 2022 and in 2023, um, which was very surprising. And nobody saw this coming and nobody really knows why it happened. Maybe this because bonds uh, were much more volatile and they weren't the safe haven that they were in the past. I've seen other theories that um, American companies on average um, are less cyclical, at least at the top end. 
um, I guess we can all we can all make a reason up. We can all make up a reason why, but we really don't know why the equity risk premium is is as low as it is today. This is why a number of 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 experts, in particular those with a long beard and have been in the sector for quite a while, while they're worried about where equities are, why they call the, the equity market uh, overvalued. Were this to correct back to just the average of where it was, we are talking easily a minus 20%. That's just the general, the broader context. So, but is this going to happen? And we actually don't know. We don't know why it came down in the first place. So it's very difficult to assess why then it would be, it would be referred back. It could well be that this is a gradual process and that we're basically staring towards a share market that, that has some headwinds in the years ahead. Uh, my view is at this point in time is because we can't really explain why that happens. It's very difficult then to become very worried about something that we can't really explain. But needless to say, it is on many experts' radar and they're watching this like a hawk. And depending on your bullish on your or your bearish view, this features or or this features not. And um, us, just simple humans, we we probably just have it, have to take it for what it is. Because as this year and last year have proven, making forecasts it it, it is easy, but making accurate forecasts that is incredibly incredibly and incredibly difficult. Um, coming back. To the to the traders versus investors um, difference. Um, there's another one, of course, between those who uh, think they can assess markets based on fundamentals, and there's those who uh, who like to look at price charts and 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 levels and 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 zones and and trends and etc. Um, those forecasts are in both cases, um, are laughable, depending on where you sit. Um, there's no doubt that on occasion, uh, those who um, who like to pay attention to charts are, are laughing their socks off, uh, while all those people based on fundamentals are doing the opposite thing. Um, from personal experience, um, there's, there's definitely the, the, a similar uh, observation to be made uh, towards the other side. The, the obvious example here is is gold um, uh, over the past 18 months or so. I've, I've seen so many people getting positioned into gold because the technicals looked great. And of course, that that's seldom to never uh, really uh, paid off. And as a fundamentals guy, um, I, I, I knew that I constantly had to make a, a reference to bond yields because ultimately US bond yields, they are the big gorilla in the room. And uh, um, they have basically uh, determined where where markets went uh, over the past two years, over the past twelve months or so. Um, it's 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 if we had the ability to forecast the bond market, then um, we would have perfectly timed the, the equities market. Um, every time bond yields went up, equities had to had to retreat. Every time the bond bond yields came down, equities saw saw a chance to rally. Uh, it really is almost like a Pavlov's dog. Uh, that's essentially how, how how share markets have worked over the past 12 months. This is also easily explained why uh, bad news actually proved good news for equities. Um, because as long as the bad news le led to lower bond yields, equities felt like, hey, we can rally. And whether it is because of algos, machines, or literally uh, us humans um, learning the trade, that's by the by, I think. Um, the obvious observation to make here is, and I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll go to the next slide here because we are now in the territory of bond yields. The obvious observation to make here, and I'm pretty certain that this, this, this applies to uh, many more among us. Uh, I'm now following financial markets for, for the better part of, of, of two plus decades. And I can... I can easily say that at least for the first one and a half decade or so, maybe even two decades, um, as an equities man, you would simply never pay attention to bonds. And it's easy for me to say also that uh, most equities experts that I pay attention to, that I see, that I listen to, 
uh, they would feel very uncomfortable uh, to talk about bonds. It's not their thing. Um, and But the most amazing thing is, of course, that bonds are so important. And for us equities people, you, could, you might as well uh, talk about, uh, talk to a Martian. Um, so I'm definitely not going to take uh, too much in, in terms of forecasting the bond yields. Um, but what I do observe this year is that even the bond market this year has been an enigma for the experts in fixed interest, which basically is the bond market. Um, the one thing, though, that uh, I, I think still stands is that bond yields, they still do influence uh, economies markets, profits, etc. So the higher bond yields go, and at the moment we are in a phase where the market is basically pricing in higher bond yields for longer. Ultimately, that is almost like similar to a high oil price. It will destroy the other end of the occasion and we will see lower bond yields. So higher for longer bond yields, in a very ironic way, almost guarantees us that bond yields will not stay high forever, if that makes sense. Now, from this chart, what I, what I, what I wanted to point out here is that the, the, the dark blue-ish, those are the bond yields, and the yellowy, ochre ones, that's the Fed funds rate. And you will see that almost in every cycle, the bond yields, they usually go higher, at least to the level of where the Fed funds rates implied are at higher again here. And we, until recently, we were not there yet. So that that reset is now happening. And that usually indicates that we are getting towards the end of the cycle. Now, the end of the cycle doesn't mean necessarily tomorrow. It can also be next month, in two months, maybe even early next year. We, it's very difficult to put an exact timing on it. But I do think that I'm not being too much left field here that, that uh, we are in the in the final phase of, of of the bond market the bond yields arise and that means and that this also explains why in recent times yield and 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 fixed interest in general is is making a, a, a fierce comeback in the investment world because everyone is thinking hey there's an opportunity here in in high yields um for example the um there's there's lots of uh, bond proxies in the share market locally that at current prices will will give us investors seven uh, percent if not more in in uh, future payouts in the us for example you have high yielding corporate credit and that at the moment is available in 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 nine percent plus payouts and as people like to emphasize a corporate credit is a contract you pay or you go out of business and um, and so this basically it's 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 a safer proposition than um, than what we have on the share market, which probably explains why now a lot of money is flowing into into fixed interest again. Having said so, um, there is a certain reluctance because everyone and the, there's been millions out there that have positioned themselves early in the year for lower bond yields already, because the timing was off. They've been absolutely, I would like to say punished, but maybe I should say slaughtered. The, if we were more familiar with, uh, and with, with, with we, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to us as equities people, if we were more familiar with, with, with the bond markets and with fixed interest, we, we would make comparisons with, with the GFC and the NASDAQ meltdown. That's how bad the environment has been over the past three years for bonds. Again, it won't go on forever and ever. At some stage, it will change, and 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 that is something we should we should definitely take into account when we assess also what is happening in in the share market. Another surprise this year, but uh, maybe not so surprising uh, for more for people that have been a little bit less enthusiastic about about China. Um, I mean, China is. The, the, the broad comment to make is that China is 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 going on a lower trend growth trajectory, so it won't it won't have the same role as it as it has played post pre and post GFC. Um, the one thing to point out here, and this is why I um, I put up this one, um, the number of 
companies going bankrupt in the in the United States is is growing quite rapidly now. So higher bond yields are having an impact on the economy. It's just that we're not necessarily seeing it in the share market, broad share market as yet. In China, this is this is a chart that depicts the number of companies that uh, become loss making, and you see that the trend. Uh, is is very much uh, to the upside. This, of course, also explains why the Chinese authorities uh, find it so difficult to kickstarting that economy again. There's a lot of debt in in the property sector, concentrated in the property sector. Um, Chinese governance is not necessarily to to Australian standards. Lots and lots of companies find it difficult to stay profitable. You see why that economy is is struggling and why. They're feeling so hesitant to 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 yet again come out with a lot of stimulus because um, that might be a short term fix, but um, you're basically increasing your problems yet again. So China definitely has been one of the dis- disappointers uh, as well this year. At the moment, um, there is a widespread speculation that um, they may have seen the trough in their economy for the time being. But I wouldn't necessarily um, make of that that we're now going to see a growth spurt coming out of China either. We do have this. We do have this um, strange ways of assessing the share market. I must say, as human beings, um, I mean, we are, we all. I'm thinking we're all familiar with this with some of the rules that that are widespread being recorded. Um, up 20% from the bottom is a bu- is a bull market. Down is, is a bear market. Um, I see those things as very flawed. Um, they they're more you they're more used useful in terms of giving us uh, a, a shell of confidence. I think, but as you as you have seen this year, um, going up 20% from the bottom it doesn't really amount to much because ultimately we we have we have no return uh, f- since the beginning of the year here. Um, I like to I like to see more. I like to focus more on the character of the market itself. Uh, have a more a, a different view on things. Um, if you look at the market this year, and I'm very happy that uh, I'm sort of assuming that um, that the audience tonight is still active in the market. But what has happened over the past uh, twelve months is that the number of inactive accounts in Belgium, uh, in Belgium, in 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 Australia has effectively doubled. So we now have uh, more than 400,000 accounts on, on trading platforms and with stock brokers, et cetera, where investors have decided, like, I'm not doing anything anymore. Um, another element to look at is, is that the, the the daily volumes on the share market, are, I, they, they are really shrinking, almost shrinking on a daily basis. And I can tell from, um, from, from many indicators, including... The interest and the questions asked at FN Arena and the, the number of, of story reads that we generate, etc., that the general interest from the from the general populace is, is really, really shrinking. It's withering away. And what you see in the share market, and, and here comes the importance of, of sentiment and of money flows. What you see in the share market, and that's basically what, what this little bit overview effectively uh, tries to show us. Is that a lot of money is has, has been concentrated in the top end of the market? Um, yes, we've seen the the CSL effects, and there's, there's a few other uh, the, the the supermarkets haven't really performed either. So the, the, the top twenty hasn't generally shot the lights up. The top fifty is basically the, the the best performer in the share market this year. It's not fantastic, but it's 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 a little bit out there. Um, then if you go to the mid caps, the mid caps are traditionally the best performing segment on the Australian share market. Now this year and last year, they have underperformed the top 50. Now if you go beyond the mid caps, you go to the small caps. The small caps have again, have underperformed towards the mid caps. And then if you go below that, the micro caps, the really small companies, they have again underperformed the small caps. So the smaller you go, in the share market this year, the, the tougher it has been to actually generate a, a decent, even a positive return. Now, that's not going to stay forever and ever. But the main question I have amongst all this, 
do you really believe if you if you if you if you line up all those characteristics that we are in the bull market here or in the bear market and 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 that would be my my main question going into this market are we kidding ourselves by just looking at at, at indices or should we look under the bonnet and see what's what's actually happening in the share market itself similar idea of course in the united states it is as polarized um, as it is in australia and you can actually continue the, the the size of the companies by saying that the average US company is, is larger than in Australia. They performed better than our top companies. And then you go a step above that, the mega tech companies, which are obviously the largest, now they have performed best. So it has become really, really a, a performance that's almost linked to, to the size of the companies. And the smaller you go, the, the the larger the chances that you are that you're basically sitting on 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 at least a paper loss for the time being. Now the other element that um, has happened in in share markets um, is that the logical response to the fact that central bankers would all mass all start tightening and all start tightening very rapidly in in a, in a, in, in in a relative sense, we've never the world has never seen so much tightening from central bankers in such a short time span and so widespread. So, if that the logical response from that could have been and and has been for many people, including myself, to take a bit of a more cautious approach to go defensive in equities because surely it's going to be bad for equities and you have to be more defensive. Now the irony is that if you if you did go offensive, you're actually being punished for it. And then, of course, the question is: Were you wrong in that assumption, or were you simply being a little bit too early? But the, the facts so far is that, for example, the staples, as you can see here, that has been a little bit of a disaster story. The disaster story in Australia has been healthcare which traditionally under the current circumstances would have would have would have shone on, um, on stage um, while materials hasn't been real hasn't been fantastic either but the real estate hasn't done anything the reeds hasn't done, haven't done anything and either gold hasn't generally performed either so almost everything that you can um well telstar in on the, on the communication services as well Everything that you can you can denominate as as defensive hasn't really performed so far, and then of course the question is: um, Are we going to get a, a a this time is different scenario, or is this simply a process that is just long drawn out, and we're still going to end up with with uh, the, the same outcome as we always had in the past? That is as yet undecided and uh, I have been too cautious uh, so far but if someone puts a gun against my head and I, I really have to make a decision here uh, my my inclination is still to think that we that we we are still looking towards much tougher times ahead and it just it just uh, has been waiting for Godot so far but I do believe that that's still coming and and I would just as a general, uh, pinpointing uh, perspective, I would I would single out the first half of next year as looking uh, uh, challenging at the very least. I uh, can't help but noticing, for example, that uh, the reporting season we just had in August uh, wasn't fantastic, although it wasn't as bad as, as feared, but it wasn't fantastic. And uh, the company updates that we are seeing um, this month uh, they are far from fantastic either as well, though admittedly we are still in that situation where you can make you can make an argument either way, because for every profit warning and for every disappointment that comes out, there is another one that surprises to the upside. So bears and bulls they can they can fight it out for for a lot longer from here onwards. Now, one of one of the observations um, I'd, I'd like to make here is that yes. Uh, Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett, they are very much revered in our lifetime. Um, their books are being read by millions of people around the world. Uh, the AGM in the US every year 
um, that's almost uh, religious people going going to the to the Valhalla, and 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 spending days listening to two old people who uh, whose words are being taken as as gospel. Um, but then these investors they go home, and they do something completely different than than what uh, Munger and and Buffett actually do, and and maybe that's us that's us humans as well. Um, I do hope that. Um, that we all realize that uh, Buffett and Munger wouldn't be the slightest interested in lilypot mining companies, no matter how cheap they become, or in low quality industrial stocks that happen to be cheaply priced. But I'll leave that. That's I'll leave that just as a general observation. Um, for those, there is there is something that 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 is to be aspired to, and that is to become better investors. And in particular, Charlie Munger always says that you can't be a, a great investor if you don't read. And uh, I have lined up two books here. One, of course, is The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham, um, the, the, the big example uh, from whom uh, Warren Buffett originally uh, got the idea about how to invest. Um, I'm ve- I'm, I read the book myself. Yes, I can recommend it, but I, I, would, I would say to people, don't read it too early in your investment trajectory. Um, you will only get more out of it when, when you have some more experience under your belt. But I'm assuming that most of you have that anyway. And, and the one, the one uh, observation that stands out is that there, there are at least three references in the book to bond yields uh, being important for, for the valuation of, of, uh, of equities. Now, I, I've, I, I often hear value investors who treat this as their Bible and they never mention uh, bond deals. Um, it's, it's not just about buying cheap assets, of course, uh, but maybe again, that's us humans too. We only remember what we want to remember and we like to see what we, what we want to see. Um, the other thing, of course, is that the average value investor, or my observation, uh, they jump in on stocks and they're out before you know it. And we also know because that I mean, Buffett and, and Munger, they own stocks for, for one, two decades and longer. Now, how is that actually, where is the difference? How is that possible? I believe that the, the secret potentially lies into also reading Philip Fisher, which is the second book here, which reads a bit like a black and white movie. It's it's old, but um, if you read it, you can see why it, why it at the time also inspired uh, Warren Buffett as well. Um, one is a value investor. The other one is, is an investor in growth. But it does explain why you can combine it. And maybe this is the reason why Buffett says value and growth are connected at the hip. One book that you're not going to find easily, and you don't have to because I, I can tell you now what's in it. It's The Zulu Principle by Jim Slater. Now, I found it by coincidence when I uh, presented in Perth and I had some time left and I went into a, a bookshop and, and I thought like, oh, this looks like an interesting book. Um, it's 1970s, it's the UK, Jim Slater, uh, very colorful uh, fund manager, had an edge at the time. He brought the principles from the United States into the UK. And that gives us all an idea about how share investing was done before that, uh, shocking. I and mean, you really, you really question on what basis people were making investment decisions in those days. Now, needless to say, um, Jim Slater had a, had an edge, but he didn't have that edge forever and ever. Of course, markets uh, catch up on things. Uh, people start looking around, um, and that edge disappears. Equally important is the, the 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 title, the Zulu Principle, and I think this is very something very important that us investors should always pay attention to, and, and maybe we someone should have pointed this out to us in, in a much earlier phase. See, Jim Slater's wife came from South Africa, and when she arrived in the UK, she wanted to have something to do, to, to, build, a, to build a career, to have a job. And she found out when she was in, 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 in uh, the UK that she was amongst the very few people who had knowledge about the Zulu tribes in, in South Africa. Now that made her special in the UK and that made her that expert. And and that's why uh, Jim Slater uh, has 
place that as the title of his book because the message to investors is don't believe the general dogma i would say that you have to read uh, the books i just i just showed you and you have to you, the only way you can make money in the share market is because if you're if you're a true value investor it's bs i mean uh, i see people every day myself that do all kinds of different things and it's about what suits you and what makes you special and where your personal talent lies and if that if that talent is chasing lily pot trading uh in 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 small cap micro cap uh explorers and developers well so be it if you become very good at it and that suits you then that is your thing and if it's in in non-profitable uh biotech companies then fine maybe that's maybe that's the compartment that really suits you there is no such thing as as one rule fits for everyone and essentially that also makes the share market it's an open forum the other thing to I think I like to point out from from Jim Slater's book is that he very early onwards, on the basis of 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 the the, the principles he brought over from the United States, he very early onwards developed a, a a list of 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 characteristics that he wanted his his investments to have, and one of the things he did was he would he would start with backward looking data. And he would he would try to assess how consistent companies are in their in their profits in the, in the past four or five years, and then would 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 add forward looking um, a, a, a adjustments projections to that to that uh, to that track record. Um, rule number one, and I can I can never understand why intelligent people don't understand, don't don't steer away from this, but. Surely, if the market is forward-looking, you can't make investment decisions simply by backward-looking data. Even backward-looking PE ratios, I never understand why people do it. The irony with backward-looking PE ratios is people say like, yes, but it's actual, it's not forecasts. Yes, but the share market is looking forward. And if the share market hence picks up that, 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 that the growth looking forward is less and prices that in, then you with backward looking data your stock becomes more attractive it doesn't make sense i mean it, it literally is driving a car and looking in the rearview mirror anyway that's my little rant on on backward looking data the main characteristic i find out of out of jim slater's list is that a he was flexible enough to change his own list pretty quickly onwards because b markets change um, for example, um, he liked companies that that uh, would would on average uh, grow by twenty percent per year, and like to buy them at a PE ratio below fifteen. For example, now in today's market, you'd be very very much pressed to to find something like that. His original list included that uh, relatively small cap companies needed to have a yield of at least four percent. Now he had to drop that too because markets change and you can't be rigid in your rules and i think that's the main characteristic instead of going through the rules i think the main characteristic i would i would like to point out here is that he was flexible and he and he adjusted as markets adjusted as well and i think that is the most important thing to remember from someone who was very good at things in the 1970s another book for those who um I want to do some reading. <laughs> it's going to be boring for those who those who only like to watch uh, videos. Um, but this book by Michael Kemp, which is um, one of the more erudite experts we have in Australia, some people might remember him from the from the Barefoot Investor, where he was uh, in the background. Um, in in his latest venture, Michael has spent hundreds of pages to convince the reader that he has been very lucky in his investment career. And if he had to do it all over again, he would simply buy an ETF at low costs and leave it at that. Now, why he needed 400 or, 400 or more pages and not just one paragraph, our guess is he likes to write. And the other thing is his publisher probably told him, 
nobody's gonna gonna spend 35 or 40 dollars on a paragraph telling them to buy uh, ETFs. Now, the book before that is Uncommon Sense, and it I have to say uh, it took me a while to truly uh, appreciate what what Michael was doing. But basically, what he what he does with this book is he tries to explain to investors that everything we have at, as tools, uh, be it technical trading, be it PE ratio, be it uh, price to book, uh, all kinds of uh, valuation methodologies we, we, we use, they're all flawed. Nothing is perfect. Everything has pros and cons. And in essence, that means that what we do, not only we as humans are flawed, but all the methodologies, everything we have in our hands, it's 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 never perfect. And we have to be flexible and adapt at it and not very rigid. Because if we get too rigid at it, we're basically working with with flawed, flawed methodologies and flawed tools, of course. I mean, the most the most common sense, I would say, in in, in when we read these old books from, from, from 10, 20, 30 years ago, is that we have to realize that. The, the economies have changed, but not only the economies, because there are companies today that, that were simply unthinkable of in those days. And we've obviously come to a stage where, where we no longer value all those companies or appreciate all those companies in the, same, in the same way. And this is why I come now to Ezweth Demodora. And I hope I pronounce it in the right way, but otherwise... He has a website, Damadoran, uh, on, on the website. And this is, at the moment, the dean of, of, of valuing equities. He's a professor in New York. Uh, you can spend a lot of money in going to his courses. But luckily for us, um, he has his own website, and he's willing to share as much information as he can for free. So if you have the ambition to uh, stick your nose into how to properly value in uh, today's companies in different sectors, in different stages of development, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as with Demodoran, he also has a, he also has at least one book, uh, but a website, a lot of data, et cetera. In long and short, you can make the argument that the times that we simply put a PE ratio over a a growth rate in the past as some investors are still doing that really is flawed and from and, and in the past we really have to find and find different ways of doing things one of the maybe one of the um uh, observations to make one of the one of the warnings to make here in, in a sense is that while demodoran of course makes a lot of uh data available and and he he, he wouldn't like that anyone um, uh, prevents him from doing that. In Australia, we have a lot of data available on websites, even the ASX, Yahoo, Google, you name it. And a lot of people, on my observation, use those data because they are freely available. I hope you all realize that those data are being cleaned, so to speak. They are being corrected for spin-offs and for dividends paid. And as a result of that, that if you go back in history, for example, um, you'll find that uh, while Woodside shares in, in mid-2008 peaked at $73, in today's data and, and, and price charts, you won't find $73 back. In similar, in similar sense, uh, BHP peaked twice at or just under $50, but you won't find that in today's share prices that you can download for free from those websites. So I'm not saying that free data are wrong. I'm just saying you should be careful in how you use it and how you interpret the, these data and, and make um, analyses and, and forecasts on, on the basis of them. Now, as you might, as you may or may not realize uh, or be aware of by now, um, more than focusing on what's the cheapest value I can get in the share market, I've, I've sort of built my analysis and my my approach in share markets around the concept of quality, of quality. Why is one company better than another one? And 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 and, and admittedly, that is that too is not a rigid approach. That you have to be flexible in these things as well. And there is not a universal uh, concept of quality. But to get to the point, 
the clearest example I can give about quality is, is by looking at the banks. And while share prices in the banks, they move every day. And, and of course, that is that is what the share market does. I always, I always tell people, you have to step back from the day-to-day -day share price. So don't sit with your nose on your screen and watching events from too closely because you will never see what we, what makes quality different from, from low quality. You have to take a step back. In this case, and it's my, it's my favorite sector to illustrate uh, quality from value. Um, these are 11 years. Um, I've, I've, there are no dividends involved. It's just share price. But you see immediately which uh, stock has outperformed the other ones in, in a massive sense. And it is the, the most expensive one with the lowest yield, but it is the highest quality. And given enough time, always expensive, always at a premium. And given enough time, it absolutely smashes the returns out of the park and the other ones don't. And it's really that simple. So if you ever want to have proof of how quality exerts itself, compare Commonwealth Bank with the, with the other banks over a prolonged period of time. And even if you would include the dividends, the other ones are pay a little bit higher yields because the share price are cheaper. Um, it won't make up for the difference. In general terms, what makes the difference between a quality and a lower quality stock? It is making investments. And in the banking sector, um, CBA has made consistently more investments in, in, in IT systems in its business model than, than the others who are happy to pay out more dividends. And over time, that essentially uh, exerts itself and shows up in more or less vulnerability, in particular in, in the downturns. Um, you will find that the, the bank that is usually the least or the last to cut their dividends is, uh, is Combank, and the other ones are, are much quicker. The irony also here is, of course, that, um, again, uh, how, how things are flawed. A lot of people like to like to uh, make it, um, investment decisions on, on, on the basis of PE ratios. And, and they again, they're so widely used, but the way that we use them is absolutely so incorrect. Um, we don't understand, and with we, I'm, I'm talking about the majority of investors in the share market, we don't understand why a, PE, a high PE ratio can be a, a better investment than a low PE ratio, for example. Um, a practical example, about a year ago, um, I would have arguments with people that would tell me that um, uh, Blue Scope Steel shares were heavily undervalued because they were trading on a forward-looking PE of three, and today they are on a forward-looking PE of almost 10, and the share price is a lot lower. Um, in comparison, uh, a, a stock like uh, Prometicus, uh, was probably trading on a PE of more than 100 or from memory of, of 80. Uh, they're today, now they're close to 100 and the share price is significantly higher. And that just shows you the fallacy of, of, of simply um, making adjustments on a static PE number. Investing doesn't work like that, unfortunately, for us, because it would be a lot easier if it did. Sticking with the banks, um, we also have a flawed indicator that we can that we can add if if you look at uh, the gray uh, zone here that is basically the the uh, consensus price target that we calculate from all the uh, in from all the analysts who cover the banking sector one of the observations what you see is that every time the share price tries to break through that level it gets rejected so you can in, you can integrate that in, in your market research if you want. It even it even counts if the if the valuation actually goes lower. It still got rejected at a lower level. Now why doesn't it always work? Ultimately, we come to a level where the share price is so much lower than where it was early in the year, and which basically means the yield is also so much more attractive. Plus, the market hasn't done anything. Uh, so far. So people all of a sudden now look at the banks and they think, this is my, my interpretation of what is happening in, in the past uh, month or so, they think, if I time it right, I have three dividend payments in, in 13 months. 
add franking, that is a lot of return. And the share price already was cheap and the market is not doing anything anymore. So I suspect that the reason why it didn't get rejected here and it, it stayed above it is because now people are playing the dividend trade in the in the in three of the four banks. And, and this is the reason why they're now supported at current levels. An interpretation like another one, and we'll have to see whether that's correct when 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 we get early next year, of course. Now the, the two major drivers outside of uh, corporate profits, which have sort of played, if not the, the second violin, the third violin this year, the two major drivers outside of bond yields have been AI, generative AI, and, and, and uh, the wonder drugs, GP1, um, from, uh, from um, Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly. Now, let's start with, with, with AI. Um, this is going to change the world, almost a given, just like the internet did, and uh, like once upon a time, uh, the, the introduction of the, of the personal computer did. But it's not going to happen overnight, of course. And, and in share market terms, we sort of, uh, we sort of probably too eagerly jumped, jumped on this, in particular in the United States. Now, having said so, the, the, the impulse, the stimulus it did give to businesses like NVIDIA and Microsoft has been nothing less but, but enormous. Um, and, what, and, what, and on my observation, too many people have, have too early been saying, like, oh, the market's getting crazy again, it's a bubble. Um, that is not necessarily the case. But what will be the case is that it will, it will require a lot of time before businesses of all kinds because ultimately AI is going is going to, is going to be adopted um, just across the board, um, but it's not going to have an impact immediately across the board. And what it will do in 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 many instances over time, it will help businesses to 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 get more sales at lower costs, essentially. So you, you so you can you, you can see higher margins and and, and stronger growth. But in the same respect, also, it will break down barriers. So it, in some sectors, it might heavily, significantly increase competition. And there is the, the pros and the cons. Now, that's all going to take time. A lot of companies will have to make uh, increased uh, investments to, to get this integrated in their business models. In the short term, it's, of course, we have beneficiaries already. And in, in on the ASX, uh, the ones that, there are not many, but the ones that come to mind uh, are Goodman Group, which uh, as turned out in August, um, is the uh, stock on the stock exchange to play this theme at this point in time. But we also have Next DC, we also have uh, Macquarie uh, Technology, and we have uh, Megaport, and those companies should all benefit um, heavily from from AI, we have we have we have a host of of, of companies that will benefit in, in a much lesser sense, like a ticket data, for example, and, and there's a few others, and and of course uh, I'm I'm not really a fan of playing this theme through Appen. I think um, I'm I'm not convinced that this will ultimately be a net positive for Appen. Needless to say, that you're gonna hear a lot about this in in years to come, and and and. One of the maybe one of the 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 short term headwinds will be the the economic situation in the United States. But once we once we get past that, I think we will increasingly start talking about um, the, the impacts of AI on on business models, on profit margins, on economies in general. Um, it, it should, all else being equal, um, give economies a a boost in growth, and and should depress inflation and and thus bond deals now the other big driver <laughs> that we've seen and and this maybe this one is uh getting into the ridiculous um in case you 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 haven't picked up on this one we have these drugs they're injected and 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 they were originally uh meant to do something else but we have they are basically suppressants so if you take them you you lose all the all appetite that you can possibly muster so you don't eat you don't drink 
And as it turns out, um, you don't snack, you don't you don't gamble or game anymore, and and you don't even spend. You you become really really it really suppresses everything. So, two companies, Novo Nordisk in Europe is now the largest company in Europe, and you may have never heard of them. Um, and then Eli Lilly in the United States um, at an all-time high its trades because these guys they can't produce enough of those drugs. Um, so popular are they and we've decided um, in share markets that there's going to be a lot of victims of the success of these of these drugs um, if I tell you that uh, the average food company in the United States is now down 26% in share price um, that probably makes you your head scratch in Australia we've seen the effect on uh, ResMed and on uh, CSL, both share prices have been uh, have been have been under attack. And the whole idea is that if we if we solve obesity, uh, then the likes of uh, ResMed uh, don't have a business anymore. Um, all well and good, but um, reality, as we know, in in many many cases, doesn't work like that. And and I would be among in the camp that. Share prices uh, that have been hit in Australia um, are now representing very good value, but in the short term, you can't argue with uh, algos, machines, shorters, and the mob. And it remains everyone's guess um, how long and, and how far this this will be taken. The one the one reference that immediately comes to my mind is is uh, Amazon. Um, in 2016, uh, we got wind of the fact that Amazon was coming to Australia and we just sold every every retailer, every consumer-oriented stock. Um, that obviously proved quite silly in hindsight, but it took a while before those before those share prices recovered. And, and of course, retailers have had problems since, but it was almost never related to Amazon. Even today, uh, we, it was so many years later. And I... I'm pretty confident that we we will see the same ultimately happen with with these wonder drugs. It's just that it also shows you in a low uh, volume environment and 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 in general terms, sentiment, it's humans. It is so important. I mean, and you can you can probably uh, extend that to the fact that you have micro caps, small caps, and 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 mid caps. Um, it's not that those companies all of a sudden are, are all not worth our attention. It's just that I mean, sentiment is not there. And in particular, money flow is not there. It's not going to stay around forever, just like bond deals will not forever and ever keep on going up. But for the time being, that's the cocktail we have to work with. And on our own, we can't change it. One more thought is that a lot of people tend to get excited when, when central bankers um, ultimately stop hiking and we may or may not uh, be at that point it's not quite certain at this point in time there may still be there may still be the occasional uh, further hike uh, in front of us so we're not there yet but probably the most important thing is is that if history repeats itself and those rate hikes start having an impact on economies then the end of of hikes is not good news for the share market. And that's basically what this what this chart shows you. It sh basically shows that uh, there should be tougher times that, that comes uh, after that. And that's what I mean, history shows us. In general terms, um, I, I run a portfolio and that portfolio has definitely uh, not performed uh, to its, uh, to its uh, maximum, <laughs> maximum capacity this year uh, or last year. Um, it is built around my my uh, my uh, research into all weather stocks. Uh, equally important, um, I've given you some tips about books you can read, but you can also read some of my my writings. They are meant to uh, stimulate your thinking and maybe to educate you a little bit as well. Um, you can reach them uh, if you if you put slash secret after the the web address of FN Arena, and that report is basically I I. I on a regular basis or irregularly, I update that. And you can download it anytime you want. And um, I think I've been talking for quite a while here. I'm, 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 I might have, I might have missed the joke left, right, and center. But and I didn't really put on my my funny hat. 
and as you can see, I didn't really lose my my shirt and my pants. But um, I hope, just like any other time, that um, I've given you a few things to think about at the very least. And um, I'm open for questions.